Great, so uh, I'm going to try to take uh, about half an hour to give you a little bit of background on ThoughtWorks, me, why I have anything to say about this, really spend the bulk of the time talking about a few interesting, impactful open source projects that are going on in the developing world, and then I think I'm going to insult you, or at least I'm going to try and have that lead into a discussion. So just get prepared. In about 25 minutes, I'm going to do my best to insult everyone in the room. Um, so if you've, anyone here has ever heard of ThoughtWorks, that's where I work, uh, you might know us as the Agile Software Development Company or maybe as Martin Fowler's company. It isn't actually his company. He's our chief scientist, but everybody thinks he, it's his company. Uh, or maybe the people behind Selenium test automation or some of the other open source tools we do. Um, what you might not know about us is that even though we're fairly large, we're about 2,500 people in 12 different countries as of this week. We just opened an Ecuador office. We were 11 countries last week. Um, what you might not know is that we're a slightly strange place. We are a private company. <laughs> Michael's laughing because he knows us. Um, we're a privately held company, and we have a mission that we break down into three pillars. And the first one, this is kind of why we're private, is to run a sustainable business, by which we mean we're not actually out to maximize profit, return share, do shareholder return. We want the business to sustain and grow to drive the other two pillars of the business. Uh, the first one is to champion software excellence, which is about uh, both being really good at delivering for clients, of course, but also helping to drive new methodologies, new software approaches, and really trying to be uh, out there helping the, the tech industry do a better job of what we do, which is in part what I'm here to talk about and how I might insult you talking about what the tech industry does or does not do for, or the tech movement broadly for the developing world. Uh, the last pillar of our mission is the one that's probably most unusual for a private for-profit company, which is to advocate passionately for social and economic justice, which is where my role comes into the company as the co-director of what we call our social impact program. And the social impact program, very simply, has the mission to serve organizations that empower the disempowered, the underserved, and the poor. And the reason this is a couple levels down is we recognize that we are not the experts in delivering healthcare in Haiti or in helping uh, civic engagement among youth in Kenya, or I could go on. But we do know organizations that are great at that that don't necessarily have a lot of technical capacity, and we can help them with technology do their work better. So, who do we work with? These are some logos of some organizations uh, that we work with. It ranges from giant international organizations like World Vision, UN agencies like UNICEF, open source projects like the OpenMRS project, uh, small uh, startup uh, social enterprises, for profit and nonprofit, people like Simpin Networks, who you probably haven't heard of. They're very small, but they're actually quite cool. Uh, this is a, a sampling of it. The main thing here is. The point of the social impact program is to have as much positive social impact as we possibly can, leveraging technology. And that means working with organizations that put their social mission first. We don't really care how they get their money to sustain their mission. They can receive grants. They can be standard uh, traditional charities. They can be hybrid organizations. I see someone here from Mozilla. So half corporation, half foundation. They can be for-profit enterprises. We don't care as long as they put their mission first. And so if you remember back to our three pillar mission at ThoughtWorks, we try to balance those three pillars equally, which means we would not be a social impact client to ourselves. We might be a cool commercial client because we have a social mission, but we don't put that above all others. We put it alongside the others. In the social impact program, we work with organizations whose social mission is preeminent. Um, so what about me? What about my background? I'm a uh, software developer user interface designer, uh, was a Silicon Valley entrepreneur for many years, and then learned that I do my best work under direct supervision by the clients, and started working uh, with a nonprofit in San Francisco doing technology implementations in sub-Saharan Africa. 
And this is what happens when you bring wireless and phone service to a school while in session. The teachers eventually give up and let everybody come out <laughs> and make sure you're doing a good job. Um, so moving on to a few projects. What I want to do now is just give a little bit of a survey of some interesting projects out there to give a sense of the different range of things that are happening in the open source world, really focusing on the social sector, emerging markets, developing countries, low resource countries, low income countries. There's all sorts of words that people use to describe it. Uh, is anyone familiar with Frontline SMS? This is actually one of the best known. <laughs> Michael's going, making faces because he's going to know all of these. Um, this is probably one of the best known open source projects uh, in the social sector in the developing world. It's super simple, which is what makes it cool. It's a, a desktop app that uh, is now has been rewritten in uh, Groovy. And it runs on you know, Windows, Linux, Mac, whatever you can run a, a JVM on. And you plug a standard phone into it. Make sure you've got some airtime on the phone. And it lets you do mass SMS. It seems really, really, really simple. And it is really, really simple. But people have built, because it's so easy to use, and most of these social sector organizations do not have anybody technical on staff. It brings the capability of mass communications into the hands of organizations that never had it before. So a couple cool things that have been built on top of it. Does anyone know what this logo is here? It's the Ushahidi project. U-S-H-A, uh, Ushahidi, H-I-D-I. Check it out. It is a system for crowds, originally crowdsourced election monitoring in Kenya. It's now used worldwide. Uh, for reporting all crowdsourced reports on all sorts of things. Uh, a couple of years ago, when Israel invaded the Gaza Strip, it was used by activists in Gaza and Al Jazeera to put a map of all the attacks. Uh, it was used, not sure how effectively, but it was used in Haiti past the earthquake for people to report folks trapped uh, in different buildings. It was built originally on Frontline. It's now grown to a cloud-based service, but they were able to get this up and running extremely quickly, essentially using Frontline to receive SMSs from people, have people geotag it manually, and then stick it up on a, on a map, uh, a simple PHP app that they integrated into, into Frontline. Uh, Cycle tells a project from Georgetown University where they have a, um, a group there called the Institute on Reproductive Health that focuses on family planning methods. And in particular, they focus on family planning methods that are invisible so that women in societies where they don't have necessarily as much control of their reproductive choices uh, as, as they would like to have, and where doing something very obvious like asking someone to wear a condom might actually put them at physical risk, They've come up with uh, what is called the standard days method, which is basically a counting method that if, you, if a woman's cycle is sufficiently regular and she counts her cycle accurately, uh, it can tell you with equivalent effectiveness of being on the pill when a fertile, your fertile period is uh, and when is a safe period and when is not a safe period. <laughs> I don't did you use did you use their beads? So they ha, so they have a system that they've been selling in the States. It's actually an iPhone app. You can get cycle beads. And they have beads, which is a little bracelet with different color beads on it and a little ring that you move around it to make sure that you're counting accurately. Doesn't work great if that means you're sexually active in a society where advertising you're sexually active is not safe. So they had an idea, why don't send a computer do the counting and we'll just do this by SMS? Text in on the first day of your cycle, and it'll text you every day that's your fertile period. Gives control to the woman. She can decide. Maybe she's trying to get pregnant. Maybe she's not trying to get pregnant. That's fine. It's her choice. It's information. They piloted this simply using frontline SMS with about 50 women in India. Uh, figured out exactly what information had to go in the messages, what would work for people and women in this community. And then they moved off and built a, a more extensive cloud-based service. So, this picture here, um, I paraglide as my hobby. Uh, I go to Ghana every year for something called the Ghana Paragliding Festival, where we fly passengers and raise money for the, the communities where the, uh, where the paragliding happens. 
A lot of Peace Corps volunteers come on it. This picture is me giving tech support on Frontline. So this is a Peace Corps volunteer. He's actually from Portland named Tristan. I went to Ghana to take a, uh, took a random person flying who turned out to be from Portland. Asked him what he did. He said he was a Peace Corps volunteer. Asked him what his project was. It had to do with um, health and sanitation in, in remote Ghana. Uh, asked, asked him more about it. He said, well, right now I'm struggling to, to I'm getting this thing called Frontline SMS and we're sending out information to, uh, to the community about health and sanitation. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool and that's the value of this project is it's so simple that uh, tons of people are using it and you can randomly meet someone in the sky in Ghana who has found it and is taking advantage of it. By the way, interrupt me any time. We had one little quiet interruption here, which is kind of a cool comment. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. So do, you, do they have employees like, are, are, you, are you based out in the office or are you like potentially traveling with them? Me personally? Yeah. I actually live in Portland, though we don't have an office here, so I am perpetually traveling. Uh, a lot of thought workers do because we're primarily a consulting company. Uh, but it depends where you work. So we have a Kampala, Uganda office, for example, that does work. 99% uh, of their work is actually for deployment and implementation in Uganda. So the people in that office tend not to travel unless they're traveling out to the field for something like this project, which is actually one that we are doing out of, uh, with UNICEF out of our Uganda office. Uh, the, so this is a project that is an open source, uh, let me just say, sorry, one thing quickly back here. Frontline is open source level one or level zero, meaning you can go to GitHub and get the code, but there isn't really an active community around it. Maybe it's level one because it's a small group that's developing it, it's built out of Nairobi, and if you make patches and submit a pull request to them, they'll probably respond to you. But it's not an active community with lots of people contributing to it. Um, Rapid FTR is kind of a level zero. It's the same thing. You can go to GitHub, you can see the code, but there isn't uh, an active community that's broadly contributing to it. Uh, this system is something that UNICEF thought up uh, to help them in their role of registering and reuniting lost and separated children in refugee movements. So if there's a natural disaster or a, or a, a human conflict, and you have a mass movement of populations, kids get separated from their families and their guardians, and that's when they're most at risk for not being fed, uh, for being trafficked, and UNICEF, as part of the international system in dealing with crisis response, is responsible for lost and separated children. The system today for uh, registering and reuniting these children is probably something um, you may have seen, like if you ever saw Hotel Rwanda, the final scene in that where the family's trying to, to find their, I think it's their nephews and nieces. Uh, people go out with cameras, they print out pictures, and they post them on bulletin boards outside of the tent from some organization. A parent that's looking for their kid has to walk around from organization to organization, refugee center to refugee center, hoping to see a picture of their, of their kid. It's horrible, it's incredibly manual, plus those people often don't have the ability to move on their own. They may not be allowed out of the particular camp or transit center they're in to go look at another one. So the, the system is uh, any technologist can look at it and say, we can think of better ways to do it. So UNICEF came up with a better way to do it, which is really pretty simple. Take a smartphone. These are all Blackberries, you might notice, because that's what UNICEF used to give their field workers. We talked them into moving to Android, so it's now Android as well. You take a smartphone. You're a field worker, you go out, you take a picture of the child that you found, you enter their basic information. That information is stored centrally and securely where it is securely searchable. You then take the child to the reunification center where they're held in a safe environment. And at that point, the manual process essentially takes over because it's, it's um, quite sensitive. They don't just give the kids back to anybody. If somebody comes and says, I have, that's my child, they go through a whole process with social workers to figure out if it's really their child. Imagine you're, you're a two-year-old, and the only thing you know, you remember, is that you lost mom and dad, and you come from the village, you know, the one with the big mango tree and the school. It's, it's, there's often not a lot of information, but now people can go to one place, look at all the photos in one place, and you can print out all the photos, and you can have that same posted wall everywhere. 
So this is currently deployed in Western Uganda where they have refugees coming over from the conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's going to be used in South Sudan as well where there's conflict with uh, Sudan, North Sudan. Uh, this project is actively taking contributors uh, and ThoughtWorks runs code jams throughout our offices around the world, but most of the contributors to it are thought workers or friends of thought workers or people from the companies that thought workers went to or that they came from. So it's maybe a level 1.5 project. Um, I'm gonna, just looking at the time there, run through these a little more quickly. Uh, MIFOSEX is a project that started at Grameen Foundation in Seattle and is spun out as its own open source project. It is a, essentially a portfolio management and management information system for running microfinance organizations, so uh, microcredit, microlending. Uh, microlending is a, uh, a pretty useful tool out in the world in um, poverty alleviation and economic development, it's an extremely manual process. You have a general system where you have loan officers who work with communities of people, if they're doing their job right, to educate them on um, uh, financial literacy and to help them uh, manage what they're doing with their money and make their repayments. Generally, a loan officer has maybe 200 possible clients. The organizations in the microfinance space, like Ramin Foundation, want to spread this to hundreds of millions of people. There aren't enough trained loan officers out there. There never will be. They need tools in order to do this. Uh, so this is a system for uh, uh, helping organizations manage their portfolios and, and manage the microloans, make more loans. Uh, MIFOS X is a complete rewrite of a project that had been going on for many years at MIFOS. This is a Java stack. Uh, Rapid FDR, by the way, is Rails with the Android clients and the BlackBerry clients. Um, and so they're, they're now a separate organization community for open source microfinance. Uh, they are a new open source project. They have their, their, now their own governance and they're building a community. Uh, it's a great one to get involved in if you want to help build the community because they've been running probably just six months now. Uh, this one, MoTeC, which started out as mobile technology for community health, is actually now a suite of, uh, health, of open source systems for healthcare management and healthcare delivery. This was started by Grameen Foundation, and you probably can't read it down in the corner there, but it's funded by the Gates Foundation. Uh, at its core, it does something really basic, which is send people information on a regular schedule. It can send it by SMS, by a robocall that calls somebody up and talks to them if they, if they uh, aren't literate. Uh, it can send email, it can, you know, multiple channel. And it's used, these are all the, uh, this is a map of some of the different projects based on it. It's implemented in a whole bunch of different domains. So the first implementation, that's what this photo is of, uh, was in Ghana for a project called Mobile Midwife. The idea is they found that you can reduce maternal mortality and improve birth outcomes if pregnant women are visited regularly by a community health worker who provides them basic information about things like health and nutrition, makes sure that they get to clinics for checkups and vaccinations, and generally is there to help them through the pregnancy. Problem with that is there aren't enough community health workers to meet with every pregnant mother in the, every pregnant woman in the world. And so they had an idea that, well, can we automate it? Can we use technology to scale it? Can we give regular information, not in a class where someone comes to a clinic when she's first pregnant and you try to describe everything she needs to do to over her pregnancy and then she runs off completely overwhelmed, but at a particular time. So beginning of second uh, uh, trimester, starts receiving messages on her phone saying, uh, make sure to eat leafy green vegetables and your first vaccination appointment is coming up uh, make sure you get to your local health clinic. And it can do things like tie in to health clinic systems, which it does in Ghana, to know whether someone's missed, come to an appointment or missed it. And if they miss the appointment, it can send them a reminder and it can send a health worker a reminder to, or an alert to go visit that woman who's probably high risk at this point because she's missed her appointments and see what's going on, have that face-to-face -face interaction and, and try to get her to the clinics. Uh, it's too early to know the impact of this. The studies have shown that the, the visits with community health workers have uh, a significant uh, impact 
statistically significant double-digit improvements in birth outcomes with the face-to-face -face interaction. I don't think anyone expects it to be that good with an automated service, but if it's half as good and reaches 10 times as many people, it will be a success. Uh, other things that are built on it, you see there's a whole bunch of dots in India. There's a cool project in southern India called Tama, treatment advice, and then an M and an A. Uh, that is about drug adherence for HIV positive patients. If you're HIV positive and you take your antiretrovirals, people have had 15, 20 year lifespans treating it almost like it's a chronic disease. And the 15, 20 years is basically since antiretrovirals became available. Nobody knows. People may live full lifespans on ARVs, but you have to stay on them. It's tricky to stay on them because you have to take the drugs at very exact times during the day. And you have to keep them, they have to be refrigerated. They can last about a month without refrigeration. So if you live in a village away from a clinic with no power, you've got to go in for an appointment at least once a month and pick up your month's supply and stick on it. So MoTeC is being used in Tama to give regular reminders to patients uh, to take their ARVs, to, send, to ask them polls and questions. Are you running low on your ARVs? Here's your next appointment. Why did you miss your appointment? To figure out how and why people are having trouble perhaps staying on their programs and if they fall off it, to alert people to get them back on it. Uh, as you can see, there's dozens of projects uh, going on based on this very basic, simple idea. Uh, it's actually quite, quite a powerful idea. Uh, this project is, I guess, open source level zero again. It's funded by Gates Foundation. All the people working on it is managed by Grameen Foundation, and all the people working on it are doing some specific project that's funded by Gates or Grameen. So it's not a broad community. You might be seeing a pattern in some of these projects. I'm doing on time. All right. Um, this one I probably shouldn't talk about because you have the community uh, leader of OpenMRS sitting in the room here and he can say much more about it, but he can just wave his hand or, or chortle when I say the wrong things. Uh, OpenMRS just celebrated its 10 year anniversary. Coming up, how soon? All right, nine year anniversary. Uh, it's one of the longest running, if not the longest running open source projects that works in the social sector. You can see on this map, this is a subset of all the deployments of it. Uh, at its base, it is a medical record system uh, for running the back office of small rural clinics, for keeping track of your patients' records. But it's become a lot more than that. It's become a core component of large-scale health systems. So it's being used in Rwanda today to create what's called a shared health record as part of the national health system for Rwanda. Rwanda, by the way, had universal health care long before Obamacare. They have about 97% of the population is on uh, national health insurance. The ministry there says the other 3% are just rich people who take care of it themselves. Uh, anybody, I don't know what your politics are, but uh, Anyone who believes that this is not important, I'll give you one statistic. People have been working, like the Grameen Foundation people, for years to reduce maternal mortality. I mean, that's a very cold word for keeping women from dying when they give birth. People have been working for years to get 8% reductions, 10% reductions. Rwanda got a 50% reduction in two years. Can anyone tell me how they did it? Because I just gave it away. When, healthcare, when health insurance rolled out originally, which costs, I think, about $3 a year for a Rwandan citizen, it didn't include coverage for giving birth in a clinic or a hospital. Giving birth in a clinic or a hospital cost about $20, well out of the affordability range of 80% of Rwandans. So after a couple of years of, frankly, getting a lot of pushback and pressure from international organizations like the World Bank and the IMF saying it's not affordable, this health insurance that you're giving, and the government pushing back and saying actually it's a basic human right, they added this expensive $20 procedure. They said it's now included. And what happened is before it was included, 80% of births happened outside of a health facility, at home, in the village, and 20% happened in facilities. When it was added, it swapped. 80% in facilities, 20% not. 
maternal mortality dropped by 50%. So all the studies over all the years about how hard it is to get behavioral change to happen and how you have to have all this education and uh, all this hands-on, guess what? The Rwanda model shows people want to get this kind of care if they can afford it. So open MRS is a critical part of that national system uh, in Rwanda. It's also a critical part of this, which is one of the coolest projects to happen recently. This is the uh, University Hospital of Mirabale in Haiti from Partners in Health. It's a 300 plus bed teaching hospital in the central plateau of Haiti, the largest project Partners in Health has ever done. And uh, they reached out to us about six months before the opening of it and basically said the facility is going great. We kind of are behind on the information systems to run the facility. Uh, and we worked with the OpenMRS folks and the Partners in Health folks and helped them build on OpenMRS to take the basic medical record functionality and extend it to the sorts of things you need to run a hospital uh, and to launch their hospital, which opened about two months ago. I uh, open MRS if the other projects, sorry, going the wrong way. If the other projects are like level zero, open MRS is like level 10. Not only does it have a, uh, a very large global community of developers and contributors, even more importantly, I think it has this group who are the implementers, who are people, it's a global community of people who know how to install configure, customize OpenMRS, because a medical system is very complicated. It's not, you don't just download it and install it. You've got to customize it to, to your work. Um, so they not only have it, uh, contributors, they have an implementers community, uh, and they're both extremely active. So the, the last thing I'm going to throw out is not specifically to the develop, a project that specifically focuses on the developing world, uh, but it is within the social sector which is there's a very interesting movement going on now among activist groups. So you've probably heard of Move On. People in America mostly know Move On. They sort of pioneered this, let's spam the heck out of people and get them to come back and, and, and sign a letter uh, approach to digital activism. That has grown a little bit to include the new model of getting people to sign petitions if people know change.org. Uh, the technology in this space, and that approach has spread all over the world. So GetUp is in Australia, My Society is in the UK. There are organizations all over the world that are doing a similar model to move on and change.org. They are all building their own systems. They've recently come together in a, in a collaboration called the Open Network and are talking about, uh, they've done some cool things like this group Purpose in the U.S. has open sourced their basic platform for doing this kind of activism. GetUp in Australia has said that, that they will open source it. This group Control Shift, which does uh, uh, grassroots driven uh, movement activism, has open sourced their work. Uh, they're all starting to open source it and they've gotten together and said we want to work together, collaborate, tie they don't know yet if they're going to tie the code bases together or create some APIs or some standards, but they want to work together to move digital activism forward, uh, in part because the space is changing. And these guys are a great example of it. It's from an organization called The Rules. They focus uh, more on emerging markets where people do not use email and do not use desktop computers. Their computers are all pocket computers like this one here. And they work over phones, text, Facebook, mix it, BBM, et cetera. So they came up, with, came up with an idea of how do you do a, the petition model that has worked so well, say, in the US, uh, in places where people don't get online and sign web petitions. So they're doing a phone-based one. They text you, and it says, uh, if you want to sign this position, call, petition, call this phone number. You call the phone number and hang up. Because when you hang up before the other side picks up, in fact, the system hangs up on you, you don't get charged airtime for it. That missed call gets recorded as your signature on the petition. It's a really cool model because, by the way, that calling up and hanging up on people is how everybody uh, in, in phone-based markets works anyway. The US is the only place in the world where you post-pay your account monthly. Everywhere else, you prepay airtime. And you only pay for outgoing calls. You don't pay for incoming. And so if I'm, for instance, doing work in Uganda, and somebody wants to call me and doesn't have enough airtime or knows that I'm the rich white guy anyway, they call and hang up and I see their number. They call it flashing me. And I call them back and now I'm paying. So everybody does this anyway. Uh, so the model works great. So the, 
the activism model is spreading and it's morphing and changing for the for the uh, area for the different communities that use it, and they're starting to get organized and pulled together. Uh, Watchdog and co and Control Shift and Coworker uh, are all based on a really interesting project. I don't know if people here probably know of Aaron Schwartz. His last project was something called Victory Kit which is open source and is the guts that drives Watchdog and Control Shift. And this group of people, which includes a lot of his collaborators, he was the co-director of Demand Progress, for example, are trying to figure out how to take his work and all the other work and combine it together. It's a very exciting space. It hasn't quite coalesced yet. This is 0.1 open source right now. All right, so I think I have enough in time to try to insult everybody. Um, I want to tell you a quick story about this fuzzy guy, uh, Dr. Aurelio Gomez, who has almost no web presence. He has an icon, like a Gravatar icon is the only thing I could find, so that's it blown up. Uh, he is charismatic, brilliant, and a little bit insane. He's a doctor from Mozambique who is also on the faculty at the University of Pittsburgh. He opened the first HIV clinic in Mozambique at a time when the government denied that HIV existed there, but the prevalence was probably 30% of the adult population, basically one out of every three people. In order to get permission to open the clinic, and this is his newest one, that's not his first one, that's a new one in a, a city called Beira. In order to open the first one, he had to sign a contract, a legal agreement with the government that said, while the government did not believe there was any HIV. They would allow him to open the clinic, but any patient he took on was no longer the government's responsibility. It was solely his responsibility. So he did it. I met him five years ago doing a, doing a project in Mozambique to help him work with community health workers, which he calls activistas, or activists, which is a better word, to provide support to HIV positive patients in rural areas. Mozambique is 70% rural. You can do a clinic, this is actually a city. <laughs> um, you can do a clinic in a city and address a population pretty well. But when people live miles apart from each other in extreme low density, you need these activists from the communities to help you make sure that people are taking their drugs, coming into clinics, not being faced with taboo in their communities about having HIV. He had, I think it was a $50,000 grant, which given what he was paying, a, a small sort of uh, honorarium to the, to the activists, uh, meant that he was going to get something like 1,000 activists working for a year. And uh, within that budget, plus some budget for some technology, and this is hard technology, like phones for them, motorcycles for the, the supervisors to go around and visit the villages. But what drove me crazy was of his 50K, he was dedicating, I think, 20K to buying an accounting package. So almost half his budget was going to an accounting package that was required by the grant giver for him to track his money. Now, it's reasonable. You're giving a grant. You want people to track their money. There's only so many accounting packages that were approved by the grant giver. There was only one in Portuguese. It was from a small consulting firm in Portugal. And they wanted 20K for it, so half his budget went to that. And this started me thinking, why isn't there an open source package for him? You know, here's a, here's a situation where, and then I started kind of getting angry, because I started thinking about organizations like a little company called Facebook you may have played with. Um, what was it, six months to initial launch? Thanks to Linux and PHP and Apache, et cetera. And now, how, much, how many billions of dollars of value have they gotten out of this these free tools that were there for them. He just, you know, 20K, he gets to hire another 300 activists. But he doesn't get access to that value because nobody's building that sort of thing for him. And so um, I want to name, I'm going to throw out some open source projects here that I think are pretty cool. You guys throw out some of you want, but tell me what you think is the commonality, the common factor in all these projects. And you know there's so many cool tools out there, I could have filled this thing up 100 times more than that. What's common in all of these? What else? Uh, 
OK, but that's not quite what I'm getting at. What about these? These are the top GitHub projects by contributors in 2012. It's true from a lot of most open source projects. Yeah. But maybe, maybe does homebrew get paid? Yeah, maybe not homebrew, maybe not. How about the current top starred projects on GitHub? I know these are just proxies. These are easy numbers to get. It's not necessarily the coolest projects or the best projects, but these are pretty popular ones. Pretty web heavy. Pretty web heavy. What were you saying? They're for developers. Aurelio can't use any of these. So I'm going to paraphrase my buddy Kanye here. And I'm going to tell you, open source does not care about disempowered people, underserved people, or poor people. We care about ourselves. We build tools that make our jobs better. I love Python. I love jQuery. I love Chromium and Firefox. But name an open source project that isn't built for us. Eh, we needed a browser. We didn't want IE. It's, it's complicated. I mean, well, and you could say, like, Firefox OS isn't solving our problem. We already have that version of the iOS, and it's going to solve the most of ours. So that might be an example. There, there may be something there. That's Let's see, Ubuntu general, phone, maybe. Like yeah. You would actually, if you, I don't want to go too far, but it's totally related to what I was talking about the other day about product management as an abstracted concept within open source Mm -hmm. you know, but there's nothing being done about that, and it's, it's not a very, it's not very, you know, like, no. not a nice catchphrase, like, well, we might want to talk about the homeless in the United States. I mean, Absolutely. You know, this kind of the other thing. I, I'm, betraying, I'm betraying my background, which is I spent the past seven, eight years working in sub-Saharan Africa, so I, I don't mean to downplay the issues uh, in the community here in, in the U.S. or North America. I just am not as close to them, but I completely agree, and I think the same thing applies. Sorry, so Lindsay was, was asking what about some of the issues uh, here, issues of youth and homelessness, and, and I was saying I was sort of betraying my own background, uh, that I'm less familiar with, it's kind of odd, I'm less familiar with the issues at home than I am with some of the ones away, but I agree. Uh, and what I wanted to do quickly was say it's not totally bad and throw up just a few things here. You've probably heard of maybe social coding from good from our friends at Benetech, which tries to get people to contribute to projects like OpenMRS, uh, or Code for America, or Random Hacks of Kindness, Google Summer of Code. I grabbed their old logo. The new one's exactly the same, but that's a three. Um, the humanitarian software program is something we do internally at ThoughtWorks, and there are companies that try to that do similar things where they get their own people to contribute. So we contribute to OpenMRS and RapidFTR and Mifos, among others. But the reality is the number, the amount of effort, the impact, the results, if you look at all the tools that are out there for developers versus all the tools that are out there for people who aren't developers, it's like a million to one. We're really weak on this. And to me, this is the challenge to the open source movement and to the tech sector in general. I mean, I, I know we like to think of, or maybe we don't anymore, but initially I like to think of open source as uh, you know, a bunch of kind of uh, hacker, free lover, counterculture people breaking down the system and the power structures and coding late at night. But we know that most of the big open source projects are paid for by companies. You know, uh, WebKit didn't come out of uh, you know, a bunch of people in their spare time. It came out of Apple and Google and paid engineers. Uh, even Linux, you know, Linus did a lot of work, but then people started hiring him and, and letting him drive, uh, drive Linux. So the open source movement and the commercial sector that supports it, this is the challenge. How do we serve others as well as we are serving ourselves? And 
I don't have the answer. This is kind of my personal mission. I've been experimenting a little bit with ThoughtWorks as, as a sandbox on it with things like our humanitarian software project. Um, and I know that you know, the organizations that, one thing is the organizations that serve the poor, the NGOs, the governments, they need to invest more in technology. They're just starting to understand that because they're maybe the equivalent of the commercial companies that invest in open source for developers and for their own use. These other organizations that are in the space, people like Gates Foundation, which shockingly does almost nothing in tech, um, needs to invest in open source as well, and they're starting to get that. Uh, probably the most important thing is we need to keep helping upskill the populations of people to serve themselves, because at the end of the day, people serve themselves the best. So there are projects like Ushahidi and OpenX Data that have come out of places like Kenya by people who are closer to the people who need help. But let's not confuse sort of an upper class college educated Kenyan with a villager. They're definitely separate communities. Um, court companies should be doing more, should be dedicating money and time and effort to open source that might not serve themselves directly. But I don't have the answer and I've run a little too long, so you have three minutes to tell me the answer to how we can make the movement serve others. Yep. Uh, check out social coding for good. That's specifically what they try to do is match people uh, to the skill sets and they have a limited number of projects on the base. But that is something individuals, there are a variety of projects out there across tech stacks where your skills, whether you're a developer, a QA, a designer, an analyst, a project manager, a program manager, you're going to expand your skills and broaden them a bit because the context is a bit different. This is something that's been fun at ThoughtWorks. I've been there about four years now. The company does almost all enterprise projects for companies that are huge and have literally thousands of developers and technologists. You get people who build for them, who are building like five nines uptime, and you say, okay, now let's build a system that can run on a netbook out in rural Uganda, used by people who've never touched a phone or a computer before. Go. That stretches your design skills. Your UI design skills, your architecture, how you're going to build the code is very different because you're looking for things like resilience more than reliability. It's really fun, but say 80% of your skills apply directly, and it's a great opportunity to stretch your design muscle. Um, yes? This is being recorded. Um, I'll say it, sorry Nick. Um, one laptop per child is my favorite whipping boy of an arrogant Western view of what the rest of the world needs. What was built at extremely high cost, $300 million in running, was a really great laptop for the kids of MIT professors. It has had almost no impact. It's been deployed in very few locations, and where it's been deployed, the, the studies have shown no impact. And the reason is, if I can be so blunt and arrogant as to say that, is it was a pure technology project that did not consider all the social factors. So a computer that's supposed to change education, where the organization behind it did nothing on curriculum, pedagogy, believe teachers were not needed, that all that was needed was a laptop that ran on low power and had cool mesh networking because someone found the Avahi project and could download it easily. That has, in my opinion, no chance of success. And we actually, as technologists, that, that's a whole other rant. If I get another hour, I have a presentation on that, on, on technology and people. <laughs> yes? So can we build things for other people? Who here in this room is a consultant or has ever worked for a consultancy? Yeah. Consultancies, their job is to build stuff for other people. 
you know, when ThoughtWorks was hired to build an airline reservation system, there was not a single person in the company that had ever worked at an airline or built an airline reservation system. It was our job to listen to the people who needed the airline reservation system and build it for them. When we got our second project to build an airline reservation system, we had maybe one person who we were able to get from that project to the new one, and everyone else had to relearn it. So I'd say raise your bar. I think we can learn and we can build with other people and for other people. Well, the other thing is, I mean, there's a lot of people who are educated in, you know, history or sociology or, you know, psychology who would probably be willing to donate their time if, if you had people from technology saying, hey, we don't maybe necessarily understand how other people work as well. They're not educated in the technology, so on and so forth. Can you find out, you know, kind of translate? I mean, and I feel like there's, there's that kind of that disconnect. Yeah, so I think him, him I mean, combined multifunctional teams that's not just technologists are really critical. I, I know I'm at time. Michael, you had something? Just real briefly, um, I know something that's really deep in our project mission and many of the others here is that um, we want to empower people to solve their own local problems. Um, so something that's really, really big in our community is mentoring and connecting other people who, if you're living in rural Africa somewhere, you probably didn't have the best IT education at all. You <laughs> Yep. Um, if you did go to school, you probably learned Microsoft Office in, at a university level. Um, so we have a huge mentorship um, kind of interactive training thing where more experienced developers will help people in Uganda, in Ghana, you name it, um, learn how to use these platforms, learn how to use these tools, and then take that into their community, start their own IT consulting business with them and the other people. And that's real international. Uh, and I think that's one of the really valuable things that the open source community can do that the commercial vendors are not going to do. Commercial vendors will build tools. Open source community can uh, build systems and engage with communities in ways that empowers them. Thank you. I think I'm done. <laughs> These are some of the projects I mentioned. Uh, please go join any of them. Join all of them. <laughs>